In this video, which is part of the air conditioning course, we're going to be talking about condensers and subcooling. So we have two main types of condensers that we want to talk about. We want to talk about water-cooled and we want to talk about air-cooled. Air conditioning primarily uses forced draft condensers, in other words, air-cooled. Uses fans and blowers to move the air through a coil. Fins are connected to condenser tubes to provide a more useful surface area for heat transfer. This is an example of an air-cooled condenser. Notice the fins that are mounted around the coils, which is the copper tubing. A lot of air-cooled condensers these days are made of aluminum tubing and you have to be more careful with them. In an effort to maximize refrigerant to tube heat transfers, manufacturers have created grooves, ridges, and patterned surfaces on the inside of condenser tubing. The feature is not seen by the customer, but its intention is to increase the heat transfer and overall system efficiency. Air-cooled condensers such as this one suck the air through the condenser coil. The fan motors, regardless of where it's mounted, does not blow air through. It sucks air through. So we send hot gases in, we might send it through a distributor, might not, and we get a cooler liquid out. The purpose of the condenser is to condense the gas into a liquid. So this is another example of a very large air-cooled condenser. Again, notice we're sucking the air through using the fans. Okay, and by using the upward, mo sort of the upward area, what we're doing is cool air is coming in the bottom. And as it heats, it actually, through natural convection, will move to the upward direction. The fans assist it and help pull it through a multi-pass condenser coil. These are two examples of residential and light commercial split systems. The one on the left is a residential standard air conditioning or heat pump system. The one on the right is the Fujitsu ductless split units. Can have more than one or more evaporators on the ductless splits. They hang on the walls or in the ceilings of, in different parts of homes. At normal temperatures, the difference between the condensing point of the refrigerant and the ambient air is roughly 20 to 30 degrees. The condensing point of the refrigerant is found by converting the pressure on the high side, that's the pressure in the condenser, to temperature. You do this either using your gauges or a temperature pressure chart. Because as we know, refrigerant has a temperature to pressure relationship. So once again, on this slide, we're pointing out that I'm really more worried about temperatures than pressures. The, all the pressures do is give me a way to find temperatures. This are, these are commercial air-cooled condensers. They're found on rooftops. You'll see that they have usually mounted with vibration abating legs and feet because the motors on these are pretty large. Subcooling takes place in the very last few passes of a condenser. To measure subcooling, and we'll go more, much more into subcooling in a minute, use the condensing point temperature and subtract the temperature of the refrigerant leaving the condenser. In other words, you're using your condensing point temperature, that's your high side pressure, converted to temperature, and you're subtracting the temperature you measure on the liquid line as it leaves the condenser. The temperature of the refrigerant is found by placing a clamp on thermometer on the liquid line at the condenser outlet. So if we take a look at a condenser, okay, we'll take a look at the operation here in this diagram. This is 134A. So again, R22 and 410A might have slightly different pressures and temperatures. So coming out of our compressor on the discharge line, we have a highly superheated hot gas, might be around 200 degrees Fahrenheit. Notice if I take the pressure here, okay, it's 184 PSIG. Then I'm going to come out of my, I'm going to start going through my condenser coils and I'm going to start losing sensible heat. Okay, again, I'm going to continue to lose sensible heat until it sort of evens out. Notice I have a bunch of 125s here. This is where the liquid starts to condense at 125 degrees, which determines the head pressure or the high side pressure. So if I take a temp pressure chart, 
chart it convert 134 psig to or 100 125 degrees to psig i'll find my head pressure so once we get down to like the second to last pass of the condenser i now have 100 percent pure liquid still 125 degrees because all i've been doing in the middle here is losing latent heat i'm not losing sensible heat so once i hit this 125 degrees i'm going to continue to drop temperature because i'm still my temperature still above the outdoor air temperature or the ambient temperature okay so now i'm at 171 psi so i've had some pressure drop which is not unusual in a long condenser coil okay so now this liquid refrigerant is cooled below the condensing temperature my condensing temperature is around 125 i'm now at 110 okay so i have now had a 15 degree subcooling my ambient air might be 95 degrees so if my condensing temperature is 125 degrees this is 30 degrees above ambient air temperature, which is normal. But subcooling is the further cooling of refrigerant as it leaves the condenser. Now, if refrigerant is blowing through here too fast, okay, I could have a very low subcooling. I could have a high subcooling if there's too much refrigerant and if it's hanging around too long. We'll go into that. Subcooling is an important diagnostic tool. Let's skip real quick to water-cooled condensers. There are three main types of water-cooled condensers. You have a tube within a tube, you have a shell and tube, and you have a shell and coil. A tube within a tube is exactly that, two tubes, one smaller, one larger, one inside the other. The outer tube carries the refrigerant. This allows the refrigerant to be cooled by both the water and the air. The inner tube carries the water. The inner tube often has a fin spiraled around it to add to the surface area. So here's a tube within tube. Now there's something else very important to remember. The water and the refrigerant flow in opposite directions. So where my cold water coming in, it is actually my lowest temperature of refrigerant. My highest temperature of refrigerant is where the warm water's coming out. Okay, so it has a counter flow arrangement. These are two examples of tube and tube condenser coils. You'll see them in some geothermal heat pumps unit. You'll see it in commercial ice machines, and you'll see it in several other places, some um, hotel units that use a big water loop. This is an end view of a tube within tube condenser. Notice the water's on the inside and the refrigerant is on the outside. The shell and tube condenser are composed of a long refrigerant cylinder filled with straight copper tubes filled with cooling water. Water circulates through these tubes, condenses the hot refrigerant vapor into a liquid in the cylinder. This is an example of a shell and tube. There's water pipes inside, there's refrigerant inlet and outlet, and there's water inlet and outlet. The refrigerant is on the outside and the water is in the tubes in the center. The shell and tube condenser is compact, needs no fins, and combines the condenser and liquid receiver into one unit. It uses numerous straight tubes inside the receiver with a water manifold on both ends. When the manifolds are removed, the water can be cleaned of deposits. Both the tube and tube and shell and tube condensers can be cleaned by pushing or forcing a special brush through the water tubes or by using a chemical. The cylinder body is usually made of steel. Shell and tube condensers are sometimes called shell and pipe condensers. The third type is a shell and coil. This condenser consists of a coil of copper tubing winding around the inside of a metal refrigerant cylinder. It serves both as a condenser and as a liquid receiver. And again, there's a counter flow arrangement here. 
Notice the cold water comes in where the liquid refrigerant comes out. The water heats up as it goes up and it cools the refrigerant in opposite direction. So there's a counter flow between the water and the refrigerant. Very important to remember. The shell and coil is often used on smaller commercial units. They are less costly to manufacture, however they cannot be cleaned mechanically. The water tubes have to be cleaned with chemicals. Water regulating valves are used with water-cooled condensers to adjust the amount of incoming water through the condenser to maintain the condensing pressure. Water regulator valves are needed with condensers using city water or what we consider open loop. This is an example of a water regulating valve. Very important. They're, they are directional, so look for the arrow. That water must flow in the direction of the arrow. A bellows on the valve is connected to the high pressure access port. As the refrigerant pressure increases on the high side, it pushes on the bellows and forces the valve open. This allows more water to flow through the condenser. So this is an example of a water regulating valve on a condenser. Okay, so we have a 110 degrees. Okay, refrigerant condensing at 100 degrees. So notice the 10 degree difference. Okay, and we'll go faster or slower depending on water temperatures and pressures and refrigerant pressures. As the head pressure decreases, the pressure on the bellows decreases and allows the spring to push the valve closed. The valve modulates to maintain the correct head pressure and reduces water consumption. This is again on an open loop system where their water is wasted or used for other purposes once it's done cooling the condenser. Okay, they're not allowed in a lot of municipalities and they're, you have to check local code before you use them. Most often now we're using closed loop systems. When a compressor stops, the head pressure drops and the water regulating valve will close. This prevents the waste of street or well water. The other way to cool, cool water cooled condensers is the use of a water tower or cooling tower. The tower is used to cool water in the water cooled condensers. The water used by the condenser is stored in the tower and pumped to the condenser when the system compressor runs. The water returns to the top of the tower after absorbing heat from the refrigerant in the condenser. Okay, so the water then comes and sprays down the, okay, the inside and is recirculated. Okay, this is just another example, okay, we're pushing our water through the condenser. We're pushing it up into a cooling tower. We're pulling it back down through the pump. The heated water falls through, falls through the tower over baffles, cooling through evaporation as it gets to the bottom. The cooled water collects in the sump or the bottom of the tower and gets pumped back to the condenser. So again, we have cooled water that's going to the pump. It circulates through the condenser. Well, it's not in the picture here and returns as warm heat laden water from the condenser. It sprays down into the cooling tower. Okay. And it flows down through baffles and slats. As the wind blows over that, it uses evaporative cooling to cool the water. Water evaporates off, takes heat with it. Now, because of that, we have to have makeup water. That's what the float is for. As the water level drops too far, the float drops and allows makeup water to come into the system. Some systems use fan motors to help pull air through. Okay. Very important, cooling towers depend on temperature and humidity. We have to have a low enough humidity to make the water evaporate and therefore heat dissipate. Fans are sometimes used to aid the tower and speed up cooling. The fans are controlled by the water temperature. The ability of the tower to cool is based on outdoor wet bulb and humidity. Water must be able to evaporate. And again, we have different 
types of condensers. This uses baffles. Slats are arranged to cause the water to spread. We want a lot of turbulence as the water falls. We want as much air to fall across it as possible. Evaporative condensers look like water towers, but the difference is that the condenser tubes are in the tower. The water is pumped from a sump of the evaporative condenser and sprayed on the condenser tubes. So again, we have hot refrigerant coming in. We have liquid refrigerant going out. We increase the we increase over air cooled condenser by spraying water down across those tubes. It helps pull the heat faster out of the refrigerant. When the water hits the tubes, it evaporates and cools the refrigerant inside the condenser tubes. Fans are sometimes added to speed and aid the process. The fans are controlled by head pressure. Water used in the water towers and evaporative condensers can cause scaling and corrosion. Scale is caused by the mineral concentration in this water that increases as water evaporates. Minerals don't evaporate off with the water. The water evaporates, leaves the minerals. So what we need to do is we need to treat the water that's down in here so we don't start building scale and have pH problems. The pH level also changes as the water evaporates. Conductivity is a way of measuring the scaling potential and pH levels, and these should be monitored. Chemicals can be added to adjust the pH levels. Allowing some water to be dumped during operation causes fresh water to be constantly added by a makeup water or float valve. This makeup water flushes out some of the water and minerals. This constant flushing aids in maintaining low mineral concentrations. We have some additional condensers called microchannel condensers. These are becoming very popular on high efficiency equipment. Microchannel condensers use very small microchannels from sort of a header or manifold refrigeration tubing. It's a way to increase surface area and expose more refrigerant tubing to air. Okay. Condensers, one of the functions of condensers to subcool. Remember, condensers de-superheat, condense, and then subcool. Subcooling is the temperature of a liquid when it is cooled below its condensing temperature. Subcooling is the sensible heat removed from the liquid after the change of state has taken place. Subcooling is used to determine if the condenser has proper levels of refrigerant. And this is with a TXV system without a receiver. Subcooling is a good measurement of how long the refrigerant takes to pass through the condenser, which is called the stay time. The right amount of subcooling for any particular unit can vary with the type of system and its application. At a proper charge with clean coils and design airflow, subcooling will fall between the 10 and 20 degree Fahrenheit range. The complete condensing of refrigerant should occur in the bottom quarter of the condenser. Any heat that is removed after this point is subcooling. Subcooling is sensible heat. The change of state is latent heat. Subcooling is needed to maintain proper system balance. Normal subcooling is between 10 and 20 degrees. Depending on how efficient the condenser is, subcooling may be a little bit lower or higher. If the subcooling is low, between 0 and 10 degrees, look for a dirty condenser. Check the condenser fan operation. Look for a metering device that is stuck open. Look for an undercharge condition. Basically, low subcooling means that the refrigerant in the condenser is moving through that condenser too fast. Its stay time is very low. If subcooling is too high, over 20 degrees, look for overcharging. Look for a restricted metering device. Look for a faulty head pressure control if it's a cylinder unloader. Again, subcooling is too high means the liquid refrigerant is staying in the condenser for too long. Subcooling is a measurement of the flow of refrigerant through the condenser. The longer it stays in the condenser, the higher the subcooling is. The faster it goes through the condenser, the lower the subcooling is. 
So again, subcooling occurs in this bottom portion, okay, where my temperature starts to change after my change of state and additional sensible heat is removed. Subcooling can be accomplished by placing the liquid line and the suction line in direct contact with each other. This is usually done in small or low temperature units. The higher subcooling results in a more efficient unit. The liquid in the liquid line will be cooled below its condensing temperature. Also, the suction line may be warmed slightly to boil off any refrigerant which might be present before entering the compressor. The lower the temperature in the liquid line, the greater the heat removal capability in the evaporator. This greater subcooling can also be achieved by one system cooling another so that the system can more efficiently reach lower temperatures. This is known as cascade systems. We won't worry about them right now because that's more on the refrigeration side than air conditionings. Cascade systems are usually required for ultra low temperature operation. So to measure your subcooling, use your gauges to determine the high side pressure and convert that to temperature. Okay, now while you're at it, make sure it's within range for the ambient temperature. Should be the amber to ambient temperature plus 30 to 35 degrees for air cooled systems. Measure the condenser outlet or the liquid line temperature. Subtract the liquid line temperature from the condensing temperature. The result is subcooling. So I have an R410A system. My high side pressure is 390 psi. That converts to 115 degrees. I have a temperature clamp on the liquid line that shows 110 degrees. My subcooling is 5 degrees. Is that low? Is that high? Is that correct? Well, we want between 10 and 20 degrees, unless the manufacturer says otherwise. Always look on the inside of the electrical compartment cover for the subcooling chart. Okay, so for a 410A system, if it's a very high efficiency system, it may be correct. But for our 10 to 20 degrees, it's incorrect. It's very low. Okay, then if I look at the 95 degree ambient air, 115 degree condensing temperature, subtract those two numbers and what do you get? You get 25 degrees. Actually, 30 degrees. Sorry about that. Now, a few common accessories I want to talk about, okay, because they always come up when we talk about subcooling. A sight glass is sometimes added to the liquid line. It's a way to see that the refrigerant is in the system. It contains a strip that shows moisture in the system. Do not charge with a sight glass. You should always charge with the gauges. People used to charge by sight glasses, but with the newer refrigerant, do not try to charge with the sight glass. Bubbles do not mean a thing. Filter dryers are located on the liquid line and removes the moisture and debris from the system. The dryer is made out of a silica gel or a molecular sieve, which both filter and absorb moisture. A liquid line filter dryer should be replaced any time a system is opened. Sometimes the liquid line filters do get clogged. Okay, If you see a temperature difference or frost on a filter dryer, if you measure this temperature difference from one side to another and if there's a temperature difference, that filter dryer is clogged. Special cleanup dryers and suction line core dryers are usually installed on systems that are badly contaminated. Make sure you're aware of the direction of the arrow on filter dryers. Unless it is a heat pump filter dryer, it is not bidirectional. Suction line filters provide additional cleanups on systems that have had a compressor burnout. It's placed on the suction line between the evaporator and the compressor. It's usually changed a few weeks after the compressor changeout.